Well, good morning, everyone, and Shabbat Shalom at El Shaddai Ministries. We're glad to have everyone here this morning. And, of course, any guests that we have here, we'd like to welcome you as well that are here to see Dr. Bendigi. Why don't we stand this morning, and uh, those that also watch us around the world, uh, in South Africa and in Europe, of course, and the Orient, we want to welcome all of you and thank you for listening and watching us on Shabbat. And we know some of, for some of you, we are your congregation and we're blessed to have you, that uh, you can learn Torah along with us. And today is a special day for there's a number of reasons. Today, it was actually not today, but it was yesterday and part of the day before, which was known, and some of you know this, it's known as Kristallnacht, uh, which was in, in uh, 1938, I believe it was, right around November 9th and 10th, uh, that Hitler uh, was called the, the Night of the Broken Glass when he began his, his dream to eliminate the Jewish people from the earth. And it's something that no one should ever forget uh, nor should we forget, who brought us the Torah, uh, who was faithful to standing uh, through all of the midst of the trials of a thing that we could never imagine in our own minds. But we are blessed to be able to stand here today because the Jewish people were faithful to stand and to keep Torah. Amen? So Dr. Ben Gigi is with us today. And uh, we are excited. This is going to be a great uh, Shabbat. So rest in Shabbat, and, Pat, and uh, Tom O'Haver is going to open with prayer. Father God, we just thank you for this day that you have given us, that you have created. And Father, we just thank you that you have gathered here with us, Lord, as we have gathered to praise you and to, to honor you. And we just look forward to all that you have for us today. We pray a blessing upon everyone that's here that uh, your presence, your Holy Spirit, your Ruel Kakadesh will dwell upon each one of us, Lord, and anoint us and, and enlighten us in, of your word and your truth. And we pray that you would just uh, guide us throughout this service today. Bless the speaker, bless the musicians, bless everything that's done and said today in Yeshua's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you that are guests that are here for the first time, there's a glass pavilion that's out uh, just to the right when you go out the doors. Uh, after the close of the service, uh, you're welcome to join us there. Of course, Dr. Ben Gigi will be there as well. Uh, and of course, you may, like, may want to meet him. <laughs> but we are graced to have many different speakers and men and women of God that uh, have graced this podium and teaching us Torah. And uh, all of us know how important Hebrew languages to us and to understanding Hebrew and uh, knowing that it's God's ancient language. And we've had uh, a, a number of different classes in Hebrew. Uh, all of us here are at different levels of understanding, but I know one thing, at least all, all of you here, except maybe for the first time guests, know what the letter Aleph is, right? It's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So now you know you have what you have to work with here. But, uh, but we have many at different other levels as well, and it's important in uh, knowing the Word, knowing the Torah, and also when it comes to prayer as well. And Dr. Ben Gigi <clears throat> was a former head of Hebrew classes at the Arizona State University. He's well known around the world. He'll probably list some credentials and individuals, drop some names of people that he knows that you're uh, familiar with. But more importantly so is the word that he's going to, to share with us today uh, from Torah relative to the Hebrew language. So I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Danny Ben Gigi. Thank you very much, Esther. Yeah, I some water for you. Shalom, thank you so much for welcoming here, welcoming me here. And uh, I want to say one word. When Pastor Art is speaking about those upstairs, I was thinking there's somebody else right there upstairs that I wanted to show some connections that really revealed only through the Hebrew language. So basically, I'm here to advocate for that language, for this tongue. And this advocacy of Hebrew is not coming from a, you would say, trade, Reasons, it's coming from emotions, deep emotions. I feel that Hebrew, the Hebrew language is my mother. And since I've known myself, I'm defending my mother and protecting my mother. 
and making my mother to be the crown of my life. And that's how mother is, she should be. We'll talk a little bit later on about the mother and about some words in Hebrew that reflect the motherly attributes of both human, but some feelings that are not just restricted to human beings, but they are also part of the authority up there, Pastor Art. <laughs> Pastor Art and a Bill Voice asked me yesterday some questions regarding the origins of Hebrew and the importance of the Aramaic, and we discussed also the Greek, and I understand it's a major issue. Where did Yeshua, did Jesus really spoke, did really, really speak Greek fluently? Was he fluent in Aramaic? Was that his regular way of speaking? Or it was really Hebrew? And it probably requires a little bit more of putting some, the stage, preparing the stage to the proper proportions of where Greek belongs, where Aramaic belongs, and where Hebrew belongs. To see that, we know that people of the ancient time, as people of the modern time, speak languages, and they do everything in the languages they speak. You know, they speak, they play, Oh, to the Rabbah. They do everything in their tongue. And there are many languages mentioned in the Bible. I listened also to the CDs of uh, Pastor Mark Biltz, and I, I noticed how versed he is on, the language, on, the, on, on those nations, and you know the role exactly of each, of each one of those nations. And we know there were the Girgashites and the Jebusites and the, all those Canaanites nations, and the Amorites and the Chittites, Chittim, Prizim, Girgashim, and so on. And talking about, looking at that language, these people once lived, they had languages, those languages of course were existing languages, living people played in their backyards in those languages, and of course they studied, and they preached, and they taught their holy stuff in that language. And just like those nations, so are their languages perished, disappeared from the face of the earth, never to come back again. There is not one place on earth that anybody will speak today Girgashian, or Jebusites, or Hivites, or Prizi, or you name it. And just like the people disappeared, so did their languages. And you know, Pastor Art and people, the answer is this. The ancient Greek, even the Greek that was spoken at, spoken at the time in Jerusalem, in the, in the land, even that language vanished. It's only spoken today in some academic places in universities, and the ancient Greek, for your knowledge, is as odd to the modern Greek as West and East. They are completely two different languages. If you know modern Greek, it gives you no knowledge of the ancient Greek. And something else about the ancient Greek, I met a professor that worked with me, and he was a religious man. He was, he was a believer, and he told me, well, let's just not get confused about the Greek. The Greek itself of the New Testament is written in something, and I'm quoting him, in a poor way. Poor in terms of language, syntax, grammar, so on. Not poor spiritually, because spiritually it came from a good heart. But the, in terms of the lingo, in the, uh, the linguistic way, it was poor. There were grammatical mistakes, not just like the language of the Konya, Konya you know, the, the simple people language. Even for those simple people language that it was written, except for the books of Hebrews, it was still written in a poor way. Syntax, grammar, verbs, not using, used pro properly. It was written comparatively like a person that comes to America, from any country, and within two years or three years, will write a bestseller in English. You can tell right away that it's not the tongue of the writer. Although spirit has no limit of language, with the spirit you can go as far as you can, because it, you, we don't communicate just by words going to God. By the way, you don't, you see, there, there is the English language 
as much as I'm uh, getting familiar with that, I've only been here for 20 some years, and I could not even stutter in English 20 some years ago, just from school, you know, like, hello, my name is, I live in, and this is very beautiful, you know. <laughs> Besides that, I could, well, I still have some, some of that too, you can tell. But uh, <laughs> I knew very well that the attributes of the Hebrew are much more, there is much more precision, almost like a razor and a knife of a surgeon that is so sharply dissecting every word, and it hits us when we listen to that in the Hebrew and interpret it and understand it in Hebrew on a different level, and excuse me and forgive me for saying that, than your English does. So this is not to say and take anything of the glory of the English itself. You can pray in English perfectly and there'll be no problem in praying in he English or in Chinese or in any other language that you uh, feel comfortable with. God hearkens and listens to any language. But I'm going to talk about, we'll show some attributes of the Hebrew that are completely out and gone from any other language. Just take the very simple thing, you just did it right now here a few minutes ago. What was taking place here was prayer. I listened to you, I was standing next to Bill Voice, and I said, wow, I never, I, mean, I didn't say myself the Shema in English. Yes, the words do reach out to where they need to reach, up there. They do, no doubt. And if a person is mute and cannot say one word in any language, and yet the heart wants to communicate with the Creator, and that person can do only this, or this, I don't want to kick it too hard, but anything like that, the words will be listened to and hearkened. God will hearken. Yet, yet, there is something in the Hebrew which is very intimate between the Creator and people. It's the language of God and angels. It's the language the Bible is written in, and nobody can argue and doubt that in any way. And naturally, if I go and I sit back next to, let's pick again Pastor Art here, because Pastor Mark is not here, and I'll tell Pastor Art in his ear, you know, I'm, my name is Danny, and I was born in Israel, and I went to the military, in the Israeli military, and I did that, and that, and that, and that, and I give you like 15 details. I say, go ahead, whisper, you know the telephone game. Whisper it. We don't even need to get to the end of the audience. By the time he gets to the third or fourth row, say, yes, what do you know about me? I say, well, I know that your name is Samuel, and you're born in Guatemala, right? He say, yes, exactly right. That's exactly right. And this would happen when you get it chewed up in a second, third, and fourth language. And this is the issue of the translation, Pastor Art and people. It's the, the issue of the translation is that we carry a cognitive noise. Anytime I say to you something, I'm talking from my perspective, from my inner knowledge and structure of my personality, emotions, morals, and ethics, and anything else, and knowledge. And when you receive it, you receive it it's going to be embedded now to your structure of personality, um, uh, knowledge, uh, uh, ethics, and so on, and you'll interpret it not in the same way, anything. So the Hebrew is a common ground. Look what happens with all those Bibles, and this is a great proof. You see people using the New, the new King James and the Old King James and the NIV, and the New American Standard, and there is one Bible that I've seen, it's called the Street Language Bible, which is bless their soul of people that otherwise cannot read anything. So what would be the language, the lingo used in the Street Language Bible? God say to Abraham, hey buddy, do you want to take your kid? Let's do this. You know, I don't know. But the message still goes across because that's the best that they can do. But talking about the accuracy of the book itself, and the precision, the cut, the, the, the razor sharp precision, we are missing it. We are missing it across the board, across the board. If we say, I was using an example here, first time in Washington years ago. Uh, well, it's, the Bible is paved with mistakes. The English and the other language Bibles are paved with mistakes. I taught a group of several pastors, and that was a good lesson for me. That's the first time I worked with pastors. That's how I met Frank Seekins. He was in that group too, and some other pastors. And um, they brought their Bibles, and I was 
astonished to find that there are between five to ten departures from the accurate word in Hebrew in each page. Not chapter, not book, in each page. Five to ten departures. Some of which are very minute. You'd call them innocent. Just innocent, just because of translation issues. I can tell you one thing and you go and transmit it to somebody else. You miss the meaning. But some of them were not that innocent. We call those value-embedded departures from the word. We say one thing, and they want to say, hey, you know, we have a better way to do that. We know kind of better than God. You know, you're familiar with the teaching of Pastor Bilt about the King Solomon, right? I know, I know you, you talked here and in other places too. And in that particular teaching, um, King Solomon take, took the authority to mistranslate what God was saying to him. He got a command about the year bay, our bay, you know, they multiply the wives. And this is King Solomon. But what about other people? Are we free of arrogance? Are we free of power? And you know what power does to people when we really gain it? What happens then? when you were to translate something and move it, bring it to the next generations of students, you'll take a, a scripture and you'll do, let's put it, let's talk about King James. They did, I believe they did for the best of their knowledge, but the best of their knowledge was limited because they did not know Hebrew from inside, from the core. They missed that. I'll give you an example. Um, take, for instance, the story of Abraham. I can read it here. I mean, I know it by heart, but let's... All right, it's in uh, Genesis 22, 2. That's the first time I'm ever quoting it. Normally, I say people find it in the book. I know, I know it's there. But, all right, Genesis 22, 2. God says to Abraham, well, I know it by heart anyway, so he says to him in Hebrew, Kach na et bincha et yechitcha asher hafta. In other English words, he says to him, in your English translation, in most of your Bibles I've seen, it says, now take your son. Okay, this is, what happens in this statement is the fourfold make no mistake action. God does not want him to misconstrue, misunderstand what he wants him to do. So what he does, he tells him, and this is like a very great contrast to the whole we know in Genesis. Half of the book is promising him that he will going to be inherit the land. And he's going to be the, you know, his seed will spread all over. He'll be a great nation. Avraham, the father of nations. And all those promises, promises, promises. And then he tells him, go kill him. But how does he tell him, go kill him? Not just like, this, you know. In the English translation, he says to him, and this is the make no mistake. You know, I can tell you something and say, ah, I didn't really mean to say that. No, 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 no. It leaves no room to mis for misinterpretation. He says to him, in the English, it says, now take your son. Not enough. He has only one anyway. Stop. Okay, no. The only one. Don't get misunderstand me. Take your son. And it says now in the beginning. The only one. Enough. I got it. You know, this is harsh enough what you're going to say. No, make no mistake. Now take your son, the only one, the one that you love, Asher Ahavta. And if that's not enough shoving the knives in the heart of Abraham, he adds, take Isaac, fourfold. Now take your son, the only one, the one that you love, take Isaac. Make no mistake what I want you to do and sacrifice it to me for one of the mountains I'll show you. You would say, if that was people involved here and not the Creator, you can understand the Gnostic theologists and the others, why were they blaming the God of Israel, the God, the Father, of being very harsh, God of wrath and anger, God of, you know, who, you know, let's go to Jesus. He's a loving God only to him and let's dump and drop that god of wrath and anger and the translation people is affected by that attitude 
It did not start only with the Gnostic theologies there in Alexandria and later on that almost confiscated the entire church and would have changed Christianity forever to make it almost like a pagan language because they're about to dump the Old Testament from the teaching there. Rather, they understood the fathers of the church at the time that we cannot go that path and just... But the idea, what happens if you really want to incriminate someone? I'll find out, I'll look at all kinds of things and I'll find out things to label him. Say, hey, we saw him drinking three glasses of wine. We saw, I don't know what, you, you, you name it. You, know, we, you, don't, you want to incriminate someone or you know to show, if, you, if somebody really plans to show some person in a bad light, it's very easy. And that's what they were doing. They were trying to point at God of Israel, the Father God, the, the Father God as a non-merciful God in order to create the contrast to Jesus, Yeshua, that is the merciful, which is true, but it's only half the truth. The mercy of the Father is lacking from the world. Is that the reality? But you look at this verse. Here is a man. You know how old he was. He was close to 100, and his wife is very old. He promises him all throughout the whole thing, all these covenants and this, and, and, and he has to go to a lot of harsh thing, even the cutting thing, you know, the circumcision, <laughs> was pretty harsh for these people. <laughs> and give up the statues and give up all that. And then with the promises, he finally gives him the son and he wants to kill him, just like that, says to Abraham. But the Hebrew has something that the English completely missing out. The English, anywhere you look, it says the now take your son. But the Hebrew does not say now whatsoever. What the Hebrew says there is one simple word, and that word is sounding like now, but it's not now, it's na. The word na in Hebrew is a soft word. It means please, please, please. It's almost like I'm giving you a very harsh command and laying a hand on your shoulder and I say, please, do it for me. That's the na is there. Has the mercy of the Father saying, trust me. Not just now, take your son. And you think, where is the, oh, this is harsh. This is like, we can see the heart, the merciful heart of God. Precision of the language. Another one. You, what do you do in English when you want to speak to God? You basically what? Pray, right? How do you pray? By doing what? By saying a prayer, right? That's common to say that. Do you have any other way to say it in English, to say a prayer? You don't, right? I say a prayer, right? Can anybody come up with something better than say a prayer? Or this is the way to speak it, right? You don't say emanate a prayer. You don't say utter a prayer. You just say say a prayer. Even the song, say a little prayer for me, right? You don't say a prayer in Hebrew. It's not accurate. It's not precise, and it's not correct. What is saying? Let's see, I speak with this gentleman. What's your name? Jeff. Jack. Jeff or Jeff? Yeah. Jack. I speak with Jack. We're standing, assuming that he's more or less my height. You know, I don't know his height, he's taller. But assuming that you're my height, we talk. I speak to you straight, right? I will never speak to you like this. I'm, okay, now, right now. Uh, Jack, how you doing? Okay, fine. Wonderful, Jack. I, you know, I, I'll speak. Yeah, Jeff. Jeff. <laughs> Jeff. Yeah, yeah. All right. So you say Jack before, you're wrong, but that's okay, I'll, I'll make a mistake. <laughs> so I speak to Jeff, and I will not speak to you like that. So Jeff, you, okay, I'll, I'll face you, and my words will go in a vector way from me to you, you answer me. This is, I'll say to you something, you'll say to me something back. This is a way to communicate with people. We don't say a prayer to God. God is not in our level that we can say to him something. You see, a Hebrew recognizes that. And therefore, in Hebrew, you don't say a prayer. What you do, you lift up a prayer. So the word in Hebrew is no se tfila. No se from the root nasa, which means to lift up a prayer. It shows you the direction versus the, my conversation with Jeff. That is not going straight, we pray, our prayer has to go up 
indicating the place we're starting this conversation today, where the direction of the Lord is. We know He's up, so we lift up a prayer. Just like one basic thing about that. Let's see for a moment where you, we said here the blessing of the children. If the, uh, what's the lady that is putting the slide? Can we see um, slide one, please? In this book, we put this prayer, okay? And I hear in every place that respects itself, this prayer is said. I heard it here. We, we can work a little bit with the accent, the intonation. I notice the intonation is a problematic thing when it comes to Hebrew. But when we talk to God, the accuracy of the word in Hebrew is important. Okay, let's keep the slide there for a moment, and I want to tell you something. About the way that we speak to the Lord, we can speak in English and in Spanish and in Turkish and in any language. Uh, take people that came from across the border. In Arizona, it's more common. They come from Mexico, they join a church or a synagogue or something, and they become members, full-pledged members. They even are part of the worship team or the music team, and they take full functions there. But they came from Spanish, from Spanish language country. They came from Mexico, they've been in America in 25 years already. And they do everything in English. The English is perfect. And then at the end of the service, the Juan and Maria are getting back to their car to drive home, and he wants to confirm and reaffirm his love to her. Do you think he's going to say, Juan is going to say to Maria, Maria, I love you? No way, Jose. <laughs> he's going to say to her, Te amo, right? You're going to say to her, well, that's, a, a, that's Spanish or Italian. He will say to her in Spanish, I love you, because this is their tongue of intimacy and not English with all due respect. You know that. So what happens is when we speak with God, we can speak to him in any language, but Hebrew words that are emanated to the world or lifted up, nasa, the word nose, have a different power and impact in the high heavens when they sound in Hebrew rather than in other language, not to take away the glory and the true intention of the heart in speaking English. But Hebrew is the intimate tongue of God, angels, and people when they talk to him. So it is good to speak in Hebrew. In the back of this book, we wrote something that we took from ancient traditions, from first steps. And we found out that Hebrew is always referred to as the holy tongue, to the extent that in some places, even in the New Testament, they said, do not pray in the tongue. They really meant do not pray in Hebrew, lest they will think you're drunk. But that's, that's a different subject. I don't want to get too deep into this. I, we can explain it. But the idea was, and it's until this very day, we spoke about that during lunch yesterday with Pastor Art and uh, Bill Voice, that the prayer, you, you find out the most remote group from Judaism today, I mean, I shouldn't even say that, that's already labeling, but let's say remote from the main orthodoxy line, and you'll say reform, right? You know, there is the orthodox, there is the conservative, and there is the reform. And they do a lot of things in, in their way. But one thing is still done in Hebrew and in Hebrew only, and that's prayer. They do have the bar mitzvah. I mean, they break their teeth, uh, the kids there, and they don't understand, why do I need to do it? But they do it in Hebrew because it was understood throughout the generations that Hebrew need to stay. Like I said in the beginning, the Girgashian, the Jebusite, all those languages and nations disappeared from the face of the earth, never to come back here again. Nobody can claim they belong there, nor, nor will someone speak those languages and say, that's my language, that's a tongue that is valid. Yes, two villages in Syria speak Aramaic and another one there in Iraq, a village or two, but it's not a spoken language. It's not the fate of Hebrew with the reason. The, re the Hebrew was just another language. We've been conquered. We barely had dominion or control over the land for too long time, if you look back at history. But what happened to the Hebrew is that unlike the other languages that subsided, you know, language has the normal progression like life. It imitates life, language or nations or anything in the world. There is a beginning, there is a beginning point, and it starts growing like people, like human beings, and they 
climb up and they reach a peak. And after they peak, they start subside, subsiding down, subsiding, losing height, and eventually they die off and disappear from the face of the earth, never to come back again. It happened to empires, it happened to the languages, Roman, Rome, look, Greece, uh, the Persian Empire, all of them. It did not happen to Hebrew, and you know it for a fact. That little fire was burning still there in DNAs of people that they did not even know about it. It was burning there in a pilot light, like in those burners, you know, they keep the fire. And that light was continuing all the time. It can carry it out in five generations. I was talking to Pastor Art yesterday about that. I mean, what moved you to do that? What moved anybody else? Why are you here? Most people here, I don't know, I, don't, I think they're not coming from Jewish per se background. They came from a church. Some people from, came from a Catholic church. And why would we make such a big step and go and learn Torah with Pastor Mark and Pastor Art here and, and Hebrew and this weird stuff? Why are you here? Why do you need this stuff? And you get condemnation for people and say, hey, stop with this nonsense, it's crazy. I mean, you go back to your... And I know people do that. I talk to people all over and they do get these condemnations. And at least raising eyebrows. Oh, are you okay? You look normal. Why, why do you do this stuff? <laughs> I believe that it is the fire, that little burning fire that is in the heart of everybody. Let's go to, this, to the Hebrew here. So you raise or lift up a prayer. The word lift up is not something that you take easily. Um, that, that word nasa, that just like we lift up a prayer, this is the same thing that happens when we marry. You know, that's the same word to marry. You don't just marry a wife. Marry, hey, nice to uh, sign it. No, you lift up the wife. That's the word in Hebrew, nasa isha. So marry in Hebrew, same root as nasa, as lift up, is also means to carry. Same word, nasa, like to carry a burden, that different contrast example, right? Not a burden here, right? <laughs> or to carry something that you love and cherish, same root, carry, lift up, a wife, a woman. Not coincidentally, same word as lifting up a prayer, or marrying, or carrying, that's the same word. Now you know where this custom in America that you carry the bride to the room, you know, and you catch your breath because you're eating too many hamburgers. <laughs> you know, but you do that, but you carry the wife, it's coming from that biblical concept because Mary is carry and you lift up a prayer. Lift up a prayer when you talk to God, but what happens to the contrast of the lifting up of the prayer? What's the opposite of praying? Blessing. What's the opposite of the blessing? Cursing. I hear it. Cursing, right? Now, both. When I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not a leader. I'm just a teacher. Oh, really? <sighs> okay. So when you say, you, you probably know about the, the word, you know, bless. Even that is an arrogant statement. Blessing God. You know, I can bless you and you can bless me. That's fine. But we bless God. What is bless God? Where are we? to bless him. Because if I bless you, Bill, voice, I can also have the power to withdraw the blessing for you, right? If I have this authority to bless you, I can also withdraw it from you. So I'm the big shot here, I can bless you or not. But when it comes to God, can we bless him? Means we can also withdraw the blessing from the Lord. Think of that, there is something arrogant here in the bless. Bless is a mistranslation, but we don't have any way to say it differently in English. So we have to say, blessed be you, the Lord, the King of the universe. We still say it because there is no substitute unless you use the Hebrew. And you say, Baruch Ata Adonai. Now, I don't know, we probably know, but some of them you may not know. It's worthwhile for me to show it. The word bless in Hebrew to use the Baruch that you're using, we are actually saying, I'm kneeling in front of you. This is submission to God because the word Baruch coming from the Hebrew word Berech, knee. So when you're saying in Hebrew, blessed are you, Lord, you're really saying I'm kneeling in front of you, Lord, reminding him where we are and where he is. Pastor Art, up there. 
Look at, uh, can we get the slide back? This is what you just did now with the children. It was beautiful. You extended the hand and you did the birkat habanim, the blessing of the children. Now look, it says, Yevarecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. May the Lord bless you and protect you. I'm just doing impromptu translation. Your, your English is better on that one. And then it says the next one. I'm trying to save time because Pastor Ma B Bill was already marking me. So the next one is Ya'er. I didn't even start it. It's the, it's the introduction of the introduction. I'm sorry. So it's Ya'er Adonai v'panav alecha v'yichu ve the what? The Yechuneka, right? The God will what? Will shine his face to you and what? And be gracious, right? And the last one, and the last one is where the problem is, big time problem. It says there, Yisa Adonai Panav Elecha Veyasem Lecha Shalom. And we say it week in and week out and month in and month out without even very, being very bothered and troubled from that statement, because what does it say there? This is the same word as Nasa, as Mary, Carey, the same word, Yisa, this is the future tense, means God will lift up his countenance to you, face to you. Really? So where is he and where are we? If he needs to lift up his countenance, we're up there and he's right here, oh, you know. This is troublesome. Yisa Adonai Panav Elecha. Where on earth or in heaven you think God is going to lift up his countenance to you or to me as a man and bring me peace? This is again, if you don't get it in the Hebrew context, you don't get it at all. Yisa Adonai Panav Elecha can only work in one, one, but one only interpretation and meaning. When, it, you know, the God is the Father, and the time that the Father can lift up his countenance to his child, and when he does that, his baby is up, and he lifts up his countenance with love and compassion. That is the Sadonaf Panavelecha. When he picks us up, us up as little children, as babies, and holds us and even tickles us, you know, in the stomach a little bit. But that's where we are when God lifts up his countenance to us. Talking about the, uh, the, the prayer, right? We lift up a prayer, nasat filah. But the prayer has almost the same power in the Bible we know of curse, right? So where, just let, let's establish it for a second. From where are you praying? Are you lying down on the floor looking at the congregation? You pray for them? No. That's how you really, you know, no. What do we do? We cast, right? If there is a teacher, preacher, rabbi, Pastor, you talk from here, up here. You never think of lying down on the floor and blessing your congregation from there, or, you know, slouching on the chair. No, you have to be here, right? You have to be here to do that. Why do you have to be here? Because praying or, or blessing people need to be casted out just like broadcasting. And look what happens. By, almost by instinct, we're doing this. You did it all. I saw that when the children were standing here. Why do you do that? Why does it remind you those two things? Antennas, maybe, and something else? No, no, seriously. When you're standing here, I'm, I'm raised above. It's enough when the pastor is here and talking to you. He is casting down a blessing, right? You casted down a blessing, casted a blessing to the children by doing that. What happens if you don't do that? Why do you feel compelled doing that? Just somebody showed you it's your casting. It's through your hand. We don't know how it works, but you're casting a prayer. But we are also, and this is serious, we are also casting down a curse. And in the Bible, there is one character that is like, I'm taking less, less than a minute because I, can't, I, have not, I cannot finish this one. So he's talking there, and the king, Balak ben Sipor, Balak ben Sipor is hiring a man, a wizard, a very strong, powerful wizard. Even his name is not coincidental. He's, the name of this man in Hebrew is Bilam. In Spanish, it's Balaam. And in English, it's Balaam, right? Balaam has no meaning. Balaam is even less. And I don't know how to say it in Turkish or in Swedish, but it doesn't matter. But uh, in Hebrew, Bilam is made of two words. The one is Bela, the other, Bela-am. You know, Bela means to speak evil, and Am means a nation. So the mere name of this man means to speak evil of a nation. So at the moment of his birth, 
His destiny is already folded and embedded in his name that his mother gave him. And he is called Bilam to curse the nation. So what happens there? You know the story. He tried to resolve, you know, there is a big debate going on. And he, Balak ben Tippor is promising him a lot of riches and gold and gifts and that. Curse them. And where does he curse them? Look, these people are coming in a crucial moment in the history of the world. They're entering the Holy Land. They're coming out of slavery from Egypt for 400 years. They're entering the land. This is a crucial moment of the history, in the history of the world. There is another crucial moment in the history of the world. I'm going to talk about it maybe in the second half or maybe in tomorrow, on Monday. We'll see how it goes. But to finish this one, Balaam, Balaam, Bilam is about to curse the nation of Israel. And he is on a high-rise mountain, if you remember. He's overlooking down at the tents of the Israelites, and he puts his hand out like this, casting a curse, and he's preparing to emanate a curse. Everything works. He's a great wizard. He's in the high-rise place. He's casting it, and he's ready to shoot. And in crucial moments of the history of the world, God interferes with humans, important humans, and changes the world. And the world. Not just the world, but and the world. So he's standing there, Balaam, about to curse, and what comes out of his mouth is this. Ma tovu ohalecha Yaakov, mishkenotecha Israel. How goodly are your, are your tents, Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. The greatest blessing ever to the people of Israel, that great that it used every Shabbat in the morning prayers of, the, of Jews. This is what was supposed to be cursed. Another horrible moment of the history of the world, but awesome as can be, I'm going to talk in the second part, hopefully. So thank you so much. I did be... Gracious God and King, thank you, Father, for bringing uh, just wonderful teachers to us to help us with your language so that we might properly address you in the protocol that we should. Bless these people here today, Father, that have come uh, to hear about you and your language. Bless those that do give as well, that uh, uh, abundantly, Father, that you will bless them uh, as they help us to take Torah to the nations. Together. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, creator, and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord, our God. Let's take a break. So... Uh, Tighten your seat belts uh, because it's going to be a great uh, second half as well. It's exciting, isn't it? There's so much more. Just when you think you're beginning to get a little bit of a grasp on Hebrew roots, you realize that uh, you didn't know anything. And there's more uh, because our God uh, inhabits eternity, and his knowledge is uh, expansive and it's infinite. And uh, so we've got a lot to learn, and at some point we'll be able to be with him in eternity to know that. Uh, who's going to open the second part of the service here is Pastor Steve Yun of the Hebrew Roots Theological Seminary. This week he is having a commencement service and graduating some uh, students from the seminary, correct? So uh, we're honored to have him to open uh, with a, and raise a prayer uh, in the second half. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of Universe. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity for us to learn your language, heavenly language, messianic kingdom language through Dr. Danny Ben Gigi today and continue us to minister our heart and mind to understand your will clearly in Hebrew language. And it's going to be a great time for us to bless others and to communicate your truth to others for the coming days. We thank you for the wonderful time. And also we pray that our teams, including Pastor Mark, is traveling to a holy land. Protect them and guide them and make them the wonderful trip until they come back. So we love you. 
and we love to study your Torah through your language. Bless us for the rest of our times. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Prince of Peace and Coming King. Amen. with you at every moment father that we live our lives that we walk as we conduct our our daily routine father that we're always cognizant of you as the world spins around us father teach us to reverence you father the world at times lays waste and father we know that father that you live and you desire for us to live on that plane of sanctification, to be set apart with you. Teach us, Father, how to walk in holiness, to walk in your love, to look to you, Father, in every situation. But Father, that, uh, that way that where the world may think that you're a figment of their imagination, Father, we know that you're real. For you've spoken, Father, through your Torah, through the prophets, and lately through your Son. Yeshua. Father, may all men learn, Father, that uh, one day we will all celebrate Shabbat together and that there be no shadow of malice in our lives or in any man's life. That we can all walk in peace. Father, I thank you that for those that are here in this congregation who, uh, who have, are having challenges physically and with infirmities that are still in uh, nursing homes or in hospitals, Father, that are waiting to be released. Father, that, uh, that your anointing is upon them, that your healing is present, the power of your healing is present, that they might, Father, just cease from being in that infirmity. And for those that have recently lost loved ones, uh, that you comfort them with a comfort, Father, that only you can comfort them with. And that, Lord, even in situations that seem to be challenging with the loss of loved ones and infirmities and other casualties that might seem to overcome us, that still that we learn to praise you. For, Father, we know that you will always bring an outcome, Lord, that will always bring blessing to us. Father, bless the people of Israel today. And as Pastor Mark and Vicki and the group are moving around the nation of Israel that they bless everyone that they come in contact with. And Father, that they also make great contacts as we build more and more bridges, Father, to the Jewish people as the one new man becomes more of a reality. Help us, Father, to understand your ways, for your ways are higher than our ways. Bless the Prime Minister of Israel, Father, the Knesset, and all those, Father, of whom we've been in contact with, that, Father, that they learn to come back to you, the Jewish people, Father, that they return to Torah, and they look with their eyes up for the returning Mashiach. Bless your people today, and, Father, honor their requests as they stand here before you now and an assurance, a blessed assurance, Father, that you will cause them to prosper in all their ways. We love you. In Yeshua's name, amen and amen. Thank you. God bless. Have a seat. Uh, while I put on my spectacles here, I know we have some guests that are here for the first time. Um, and as our ushers are going to come forward with a welcome packet, we want to bless you. So who's, who is here for the first time today? We'd like to also like to know who's come the furthest. So right over here.
Easton Washington, just on the other side of the pass. Anyone else? Over here? Pendleton, Oregon, just south of the Tri-Cities. Anyone else? Bellingham, Washington, the first place for snow to fall in the state of Washington. And over here? Did you say Marrakesh or did you say Mexico? Which one? <laughs> New Mexico. That's next to your uh, home state. Well, home state in the states. Over here? Puyallup, that's quite all right. We love Puyallup. Anyone else over in this corner? Auburn, Washington. Over here? Federal Way. Okay, very good. Bellingham seems to be the fro. Pendleton. Okay, we got New Mexico. Okay. A little brain freeze. One more over here. Right here. Linwood. Okay, where's that New Mexico individual? Right over, uh, New Mexico is right over here. That's right. Okay, we, got one, we have one more over here in this row who's hiding. You don't want to tell me. Okay, that's all right. Okay, well, good. Well, welcome all today. And, of course, you're welcome to join us in the, gla uh, the guest pavilion, which is the glass pavilion. And Dr. Benjigi will be there as well. Uh, and let me think if there's any other announcement that I have to make. I do want to say this as I bring uh, Danny up front is that he did want me to mention this. He did live 31 years in Israel, and uh, he, is, he was formerly in the IDF, and uh, in 1973, I think you were in the reserves as well. And so he now resides in Arizona, uh, which is almost the furthest. I don't know if New Mexico or Arizona is the furthest, but we bless you anyway. So Dr. Ben-Gigi, please come forward. We continue with the importance of praying in Hebrew. Many times you'll ask yourself, why do I need that? What's the importance of doing that in Hebrew? Trying to focus here on the accuracy and re again establish that, that any prayer will be hearkened to in any language. There'll be no barrier. And the greatest example, we don't know what a prayer of the meek and the humble can do and the simple people. The Bible speaks about that. The little, I saw it, and I was very impressed to understand the full meaning of what Yeshua speaks in the New Testament about the kingdom of heaven. What is kingdom of heaven? Is that a place? The kingdom of heaven is a place? Jeff? Is up? Us. Yes. It's more than us. It's something that is for us to do. Kingdom of heaven really means accountability in Hebrew. So when he says the kingdom of heaven is already here, it's not that like, okay, sometime in the future we'll be accountable and the judgment will come. We are accountable now. This is accountability. But about the word in Hebrew, how it is emanates and the importance of that, um, I want to see how keen were God on protecting his tongue and his book. He knew, without a doubt, the heart of man. He knew that the heart of man will tend to change or to be air on some words, to be wrong. And I, I try to say, why is it important to you to know something in Hebrew? Later on, even to pray something in Hebrew, in the Hebrew tongue directly. But why? Why is it important to your life to know Hebrew? You can get along in America, in Washington, here, other states, without knowing one word in Hebrew, and you can float. The thing is that one thing is common, I'm sure, for everybody here, is the love for the Bible and the full faith and believing that the word of the Bible are the words of truth. Then the question rises, what truth? Whose truth? Do I trust the next generation or the generation before me? 
to give me a book that is translated to the full accuracy of the word, to the full accuracy of the law. I say law in this kind of tone because I know in many churches when they speak about the law, you can hear kind of, you know, an overtone like, oh, that's terrible. Yes. I mean, it says they respect your father and the mother. No way. It says that you should not kill. I do want to kill every two days, one for breakfast. You know, otherwise I'm not free. And you should, you know, there is an overtone of the law or free from the law. Yes, yeah, some areas of the law, but where the freedom is not a granted carte blanche, you know, gun, let's throw it away. Let's put it in a place that the history will cover it up and it will be gone. It's not the words that Yeshua, Jesus was saying. It's not. And the prayers that he was saying and the words that he was saying were in Hebrew. The amazing exchange that Yeshua had when I read it with Satan. See, the attitude of Satan in many churches is, let's put it this way, is more a degree of fear that you'll see it in Israel. And why is that? What is the reason for that? The reason for that, why giving too much credence to that creature of evil that is really not, we don't think it's really completely due to him, that credence and that deep or too exaggerated respect. Look at this fascinating exchange between Yeshua, Jesus, in Matthew, in the beginning of Matthew, with Satan. He is testing him out. We know he has authority. We know he has power vested in him, of course, by God who made him. And he is limited in what he can do. He doesn't, Satan does not create. He destroys the Satan, Satan. So in the exchange, which is a very interesting exchange between Yeshua and Satan, both using one tool in their warfare, in that kind of testing one another. And the tool is the Old Testament. They quote both from the Old Testament. So when Satan says to him something, jump from the building, you know, from the tower, or do that, he answers him with quotation from the Old Testament, using the book as a shield and power against the evil forces that are apparently at that time, could harm him. Could. Otherwise, you would not have been, been exposed to this situation. Think of that. He was in a manly, human manifestation here, and he could have been harmed by Satan. So even he was, could be subjected. And the tool that he had is using the Bible. In that case, of course, the Old Testament, quoting him back. If you want to put an underline on that a communication of exchange, exchange of words between the two, I'll phrase it this way. He treated him with contemptuous respect. Respect for the power, contempt for the attempt. And with the tool, the power, the weapon, is using words from the Hebrew. Um, the Hebrew language, the importance of that is to use it anytime you can. Many times you, you ponder on a word, and if you know the Hebrew, you think about it, revelation comes to you even if you don't know the language. The, in, in, that form, in that book, we quoted ancient sages. And they claim this. They claim that it is paramount to pray in Hebrew even if the praying person does not understand the words. Does not understand the word. It's still paramount, paramount to speak in Hebrew. And why is that? You emanating words that you don't understand, and it's important. I need to take you back to Genesis 1, 1, right to the beginning. I was in, I think it was in Portland, Oregon, a few years ago, and there was a lady. She was in charge of the state of Oregon of the skinhead and all the dangerous groups there. She was in the audience, and I could see that she is very sharp in analyzing what I'm saying and trying to, you know, try to align me with the Bible. And I asked her, do you believe in the power, I mean, and I could see in the audience, I mean, do you believe in the power of this said word? And she said, you bet I do. Now look at something that I don't know if you have ever been exposed to. In Genesis 1, right there, almost all the information of the world is folded right there, like you said before, truly, 
It's folded and you should love your neighbor as you love yourself. After that, and you love Lord. Look how much information is, it, is, is there in that chapter alone, in a few verses. It says there, Bereshit um, Barai in the beginning, God, well, I speak Hebrew easily. Well, I, I speak Hebrew since, I was, since the moment I was born, maybe a few minutes after, but <laughs> very early. Um, it says there, and God said, and Yehi Or, Yehi Or. The English, the weak translation of that to English that is in your book, it says, let there be light. Let there, what is let? Let's see what's happening. Let's go to the book. Who is he asking a favor to have the light there? Let there be light. Like, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get light. If it works, yeah, got it. No, I missed it. You know what? No, let there be light in Hebrew. The word yehi is a verb. It's a verb, and it says uh, the meaning of that is be light, not let there be light. Be. So that teaches us a principle. The word of God is also the deed, the action. Let mediates between the will of God and the actions to take place. Because let there be light is like I'm doing an action. An action is taking place, but I have to wait and see if it works. Let there be light. Let. But by what? By what force? By whom? The word of God in Hebrew, Yehi, is the action. When he emanates Yehi or, he is saying, be light. And it's been light. Not, and there was light. Been light. Yehi or. Fine so far if we don't look at those letters of the word Yehi. But if we do, we find something very amazing in these three words that lead us to think what else could be there. You know, the, we call it the uninterpreted name, Hashem HaMeforash, or the essence name of the Lord. I know people are saying it, and I'm not here to judge anybody whether you should say it or not. I mean, who am I? I'm nobody. But that word is, I don't know, I, I never said it in my life, and I will not. And that's the J name of God, you know, the J. You know, I, I, I don't even want to say it in, he, in English, which I think it's okay. Just in Hebrew, we're not supposed. What is not supposed? And again, people say, about you say, pray in the name of the Lord. Why not praying in the name of the Lord? And it's very hard to explain it. And I don't even know if I should touch that kind of sensitive area, but why not? <laughs> <laughs> but not as telling anybody what to do, because who am I, you know? But uh, it was in El Paso, and there was a big Messianic con con conference, and there was a ch the head or president of the Messianic. Anyway, I finished my time, I sat down, and he stood up there, and he used that word excessively, the name. And it's, I'm not judging him, but I, 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 apparently it was, it was, I was not comfortable and they could see it on my face. And the mediator there says, I see that you want to say something. I said, no, 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 I'm, I said my time. I said, come here, come here, come here. I see in your expression you want to say, but I, said, I don't want to take his time. He's the president there. So come, 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 come. Tell us what, what, why you're bothered. I said, well, to the best of my little knowledge is this. There are 613 commandments, 613 of them. Some of them are, 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 are omission and commission, do or don't do, and some others. Those commandments are very important to the extent that they are the real reason why Yeshua was put to the hands of the Romans to be executed, to that extent. But I know that you don't know that. I mean, I hope that you don't, because otherwise I'll be boring here. But I'll get to this. But before that, the... Those commandments, 6, 613 of them are laid out there, out of which 10 made it to the top of the chart, to the top 10. Only 10. One of them says there in Hebrew, listen to the words, lo tisa, once again, the same word that we had there, lift up a prayer, and it says there in the 10 commandments, Jeff, check me out later on, it says, Lo tisa et shem Adonai Elohecha Lashav. In English, you shall not lift up the name of your God, Lord God, in vain. 
not say, we don't say the name of God, we lift it up because it reaches him every time we say it. So the question is, well, I went to the stage and said, you know, what, what is in vain? How do we know what in vain? Lashav, the word is lashav. So let's say if I will pray now for, I don't know, for big riches and five Bentleys, one for Sunday, one for Mondays, one green, I don't know, all kind of things that we, we can... You, most of you said, ah, that's in vain. You should not pray for stuff. Let's say, I agree with you. But what if I pray for the success of my son in, uh, I don't know, law school, medical school, or plumbing school? Well, so that's kind of valid. Uh, that sounds okay. Well, yeah, okay. So, and what if you pray for a person that needs healing? So, oh, that's very okay. And if you say the name of God there, it's very, that sounds very okay. But you know, between that extreme to praying for the healing of a person and between pr praying for five Bennetleys and uh, every trip every year to another country paid by a mystical name or uh, a power, there are big gap. In that gap, we don't know exactly where to pinpoint what constitutes in vain. It might be in your eyes not in vain. In my eyes, it could be in, or somebody else, in vain. But it's not important what's in your eyes or my eyes. It's important what is in eyes, his eyes when he said, you should not lift up my name in vain. So do you have a full knowledge of what in vain means? You don't. Can you feel so strong and confident to know what's in vain? You don't. We all don't. Two approaches constituted the life of the Jews throughout history, especially in Yeshua's time. Most teachers of New Testament are not aware of that because they are missing some foundational teachings of Jewish tradition and Jewish knowledge. But it's done great in this community here in El Shaddai because I can see the amount of Torah that is added, which is very important. It's tied up with Hebrew. Let me show you this. So we say we don't know what is in vain. It could be, it could be not in vain. It could be in vain. Two approaches. One of them, you know, from the 613 commandments, Frank Sickens is calling them realities. Okay, the 613, um, there are two basic, there are, there are two ways to divide them. We divide them to light laws, in Hebrew, mitzvot kalot, and Jesus talked about them, I quote, I saw it yesterday, last night, and I saw it before. Okay, so some of them are mitzvot kalot, kalot means mitzvot, commandments, kalot means light, no big deals. And mitzvot chamurot, chamur means severe. Now guess what? Since the inception of time, since, no inception of time, but since the law was given, the orthodoxy treated the laws, okay, the mitzvot kalot, and it should say that first, the light laws are all the laws between a person to another human being, be between a person to a person. Means stealing, beating, that, killing, yes, the light stuff. And they called it light, the orthodoxy, the clergy, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those, they called those light laws. And the laws between a person to the place, we try to say as less. You notice even in that statement, for the two, for the per, between the person to the place, when we say place, it's a euphemism from God, just not to use that in vain. We're saying the laws between a person to the place are considered to be severe. So light, the laws between a person to person, light, the person to the place, severe. What constitutes the laws between a person to the place? Mainly technicalities, Shabbat, Nida, kosher. Um, on the seventh day you do that, on the sixth day you wash your clothing. Then it's technical. A lot of that is technical. Yes, it shows reverence because you need to be reverent to keep the law in that sense. But it's more, if you look at it, technical. If I ask you what is more difficult, to be a good human being or to be technical, keep the Shabbat exactly at 5.13, if the Shabbat ends, that's it, I stop the car, I do that, you know, all these kind of things. This raises the question, what is really easier and why the laws between a person to person are called mitzvot kalot, 
Why are they called light laws? And the laws between a person to the place, i.e. the creator, are considered to be severe. And is it right to do that? Well, since that time of the ancient, our ancient forefathers, until this very day, this is the way it is. Go step into an Orthodox or synagogue, and the emphasis will be just identical like that. Mitzvot kalot light. Uh, there are some writings there they try to camouflage and to kind of uh, say, but uh, this is not the focus. The focus is light between a person to person, ben adam lechavero, severe between a person to the place. And I read there in the New Testament, and this is shaking me. What Yeshua said right there was not earth shaking, it was earth shattering. It shattered the earth that he came and he made the following statement. He said, Kala kevechamura. Light equals the severe. This is unheard of. Even today you cannot say that. L equating the laws between a person to person to the laws between a person to the place. Then Shabbat is important, but I want to save a life on Shabbat. More important. Because that's a principle that overrules, that rules Israel. Today, it's adopted. It was not that adopted easily by the Pharisees at the time. Not only that, but other things too. In, in Matthew, there is a story that they are crossing a field and they come to him without even any interpretation. They come to him, the Pharisees, to Yeshua, and they say, hey, we saw your student pressing, I mean, tearing the beans. What the big deal? To, what tearing the beans? Well, what's the issue here? The word Shabbat is not even mentioned because the New Testament is a book written by Jews for Jews. It was not expected to be understood by goyim, by nations, and by pagans. It was an internal book. So they don't even need to mention Shabbat because every Jew knows that you're not, to, you're not supposed to tear on Shabbat because tearing constitutes one of those jobs that you cannot do on Shabbat. But it's true then, and they keep on doing it until this very day in case you don't know. You, you probably know about that, right? So the, oh, there's a shortcut there. They said to him, ah, oh, we saw your students tearing the beans. And what do you do with the beans? You're supposed to press them out. That's okay on Shabbat if you press. But if you tear, it's not okay to that extent. But this is orthodoxy. It goes to the detail of the small detail of the law. And he states there that the light one equals to the severe. There's a quotation here. I think it's in Matthew 24, 23, then he talks there, um, and, and he, talks, he, he talks about you care about filtering out the small, what's the word there? The small, it's mosquito in Hebrew, but what's the word there? What? Ant with a G in the beginning, right? Yeah, the gnet, right? <laughs> yeah, you're filtering with that, but you swallowed the whole camel. What are you teaching me? And this is really explaining why he's calling them hypocrites. Do what they tell you to do, but don't do what they do. Yes, it's a lot more easier to be, to, 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 to do the technical thing, and that's constitute the chamura, the severe, than to be a good person, not to steal, to be honest, to be decent. He equates them. And that's unheard of because it shakes down the foundation of the hypocrisy. Because hypocrisy, you can preach whatever is comfortable for you, the technicalities, but then still not be a good person, human being. That's like one point. So this is the two way to dissect the, the law. One of them is horizontal and omission commission, and another one is vertical. That's the light law and the severe, the light laws and the severe laws. So because of this little percent chance that I'll, we know, Jeff, we know that praying for the person who is sick and all that, it's very important, Pastor Art, right? We know that. But we don't know the borderline, something that we may pray and raise the name of God. It may be in vain. The Hebrew approach, and this is positive, you can think it as an exaggeration, but the Hebraic way of thinking, and Yeshua accepted it, except for other things. I can't get into this right now, but he took the way it's called Chumrah, most of the way that Jesus, Yeshua, approached the law was with the chumrah. If you only look at the married woman, married woman, it's already coveting, right? It's already, you see, he took the extreme one all over. 
So if he did that, and it's across the board, he will not take the light. Okay, you know, the speed limit is 60, you drove 69, that's okay. No, that was not his approach with the law. His approach with the law was the chumra in most cases, except for when it came to divorce, and he took the side of the woman, which is two, two school of thoughts, Bet Hillel, the house Hillel, and the house of Shammai. But we're not going to get getting into this. He took the approach of Chumra. So I'm saying, all I'm saying, if I were to take the approach of Chumra means this. If there 99% of the cases I emanate the word that it says you should not lift up my name in vain, and it will not be in vain, fine. But since there is 1% that I may, be, I may be wrong, I'm transgressing. The Chumra approach says you will not want to transgress even if there is 1% of chance to transgress, and that is the reason I don't want to say it because I may be wrong and I'm, cramped, I mean, I'm passing the 1% that I think it's okay, but it's not okay. So I'm not telling anybody what to do. It's your choice. I'm just saying this is where these people that are keen are not saying this word coming from. That's all. It's, you know, people do whatever their heart tells them to feel free to do. The listening to the prayer, um, we're saying it again. The ancient tradition is teaching us that God created the world by using the Hebrew letters as a foundation for creation, as raw material, as the material for the world, the 22 letters. These traditions are very long, very old, and lately they get substantiated more and more by scientific research, by mathematicians, believe it or not, that proving the very systematic, very consistent, very powerful attribute to the Hebrew letters. We don't get so close to, to define it and even to understand the core of it and the nucleus level of, the, of how really it runs. But we know one thing, we discussed it yesterday. Not so difficult to understand how everything is done by 22 letters. Why? Because look at us. We got a lot of knowledge. We are free. We got the knowledge since we broke from the garden there and we ate from that tree, it released the trigger of knowledge. We are now open to know everything. Almost what God knows to that extent, you know. And that's why we managed to get to the space. We build those space shuttles. We can do imagery of, of all kind of um, equipment, electronic equipment. We can see into the brain and you can see every vein inside. I mean, it's endless. The technology is endless. We do that all by the use of computers. Computers. And those computers are working by utilizing basically the exadecimal, the two characters, zero and one. The entire computer world is based on two characters, on one and zero. The letter A will be zero, zero, one, zero, zero, zero. Or so is D and C. And any image or character or something has a combination of those eight bits that make a byte. And that's it. You hear megabytes, megabytes, bits, bits. This is it. Every one of those, zero or one, is a bit. So makes the megabytes and so on, and gigabytes and so forth. So this is what mankind can do with two characters. Guess, guess what God can do with 22 characters. A lot more. In the prayer, in the, in the prayer there is a story about, it's a Jewish tale about a boy that was good for nothing. Father knew that, the community knew that, it's not in the shtetl, it happened in the small village in Poland and Russia and some place. Jews are very poor, they had very little, and there was a little boy that was good, nothing to write home about it, although he was at home all the time. But the father was very afraid because they're approaching the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, this is a big day. The whole congregation gathers in the synagogue, and he was very afraid that this boy is going to put him to shame in front of the entire congregation. So he warned him months ahead. He said, listen, don't do, don't embarrass me there. Don't do anything that will cause shame to us. Okay, you promised me. The boy said, oh, I'll try my best, you know, but it's good, you know, you can't really rely on his promises. He's not the greatest boy. But the father is very afraid. The day comes, and this is a day of atonement. They're sitting there, in the, standing there in the synagogue at the Kol Nidre. This is a very powerful prayer that is done. 
at the Kol Nidre. You cannot hear birds even from, you can hear the birds from miles away. They're so silent. People hold their breath. And the great moment that we believe our prayers are being lifted up to heaven is about to occur. And the father is praying in his heart, let him not do anything that will embarrass him, not in this moment, any other time, I'll take it. You know, if he spills soup on me in the restaurant on my head, I'll love that, but not now, nothing now. And in this very moment, the rabbi is standing there on the podium, about to bless. He looks at the child, but before he knows what's happening, the child puts two fingers in his mouth and he whistles loud in the synagogue. Everybody freezes. They all look at him. The man loses his blood from his face. He's about to faint. And he raises his hand and wants to hit the boy in his face with his great shame that he put him in a moment that he did not want to be ashamed. And the rabbi says, don't touch this boy. And everybody wondering, why not? <laughs> Look what he did. I mean, in a moment like that, why not? And the rabbi says, we know your son. We know that he's nothing to write anywhere about. <laughs> and we know that he's not a man, a boy of words, and he can't. But that's the way he, in his heart, spoke with the Lord. And who knows if this sharp whistle was not what we needed to tear away the gates of heaven so that our prayer would go straight to the place of the Holy of Holy. You know? So, it can work too. Many words are in the, from the Hebrew language. You use the English every day. You don't realize that you're speaking about half of that is English. There are many words are coming from English, from Hebrew, and they find itself to the... Um, to the English language, and other languages too. Although, if you look at dictionaries, they'll tell you, oh, it's ancient English, it's coming from French. Uh, my view about those uh, assertions in the dictionary is very professional. It's a very academic word that I'm going to use now. My view of those assertions of these words belongs to ancient French, or it's an ancient English, and blah, 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 is, academically speaking, good big baloney. Look at the name Egypt, Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim, between the straits, that's Mitzrayim. Even they say it in Arabic, Masar, Masar, Metzer in Hebrew, between the straits, a rock and hard place. Palestinians that are becoming a nation today, poor Palestinians, oh really, ha <laughs> ha, you know. This name is after a nation of the Philistines that evaporated from the first of the earth, never to show up again, not in language, not in people. Who is, what is Palestinians? They're all gone. God annihilated them all, and there is no trace. Nobody there in the world can say, oh, I'm a Pal you know, I'm Philistines. But this horrible name of a nation of, of pagans that once prevailed there was a vicious enemy of Israel, disappeared with the help of God, needed the help of Roman Empire to re-establish kind of part of the name there. They called it, you know, Palestine. And then the name was gone. Look, the Turkish ruled the land since 400 years. Up to 1918, the Turkish Empire, the Ottoman Empire, ruled the land of Israel. What do they call it? They called it the land of Israel. They recognized the Bible, those Muslims. And they called it the land of Israel. They never used any name like that. And what do the British do in the White Hall in London when they took control in 1918? They took control when they had the mandate over Israel up to 1948. They viciously, and I would say again here with full responsibility, anti-Semitically named the land now Palestine. Why on earth? Those Oxford people and Cambridge and those academic that were advising the people in the White Hall there in London and Downing Ten, why would they, no, Downing Ten came later, why would they advise them to give a name, and this the British have been pretty good in history, knowing, knowing history, why calling a land in a name that was extinct forever after a people that were extinct forever, you know, for generations, and there was no, no, no reason to call it Palestine, but they called it Palestine in order to cut, to cut away the connection of the Jews to their land. 
Palestine is after Plishtim, the Philistines. And if you want to know what's the meaning of that word in Hebrew, coming from the root palash. I, I'm going to do it in Monday. I'm going to get more to details because the time is still restricting me. But it's pei lamed shin, like P-L-S-H, you know? That means in Hebrew to raid, to, to go to a territory that is not yours. That's what Plishtim means. That's what Philistines means. So they're saying, uh, they are saying so proudly, I'm a Philistine, oh really, I'm a raider, I'm a conqueror, you know, I'm conquering a land that's not mine. Uh, this is the meaning of that, of that word, and there are many, there are numerous. I'll give you another one here. Hamas, you know, that Hamas movement, you know, the terrorist group, yeah, well, well, Hamas in Hebrew, it's, of course you agree, it's a much older word since than the, the organization of Hamas exists. The word of Hamas simply means robbery. That's what they are, robbery, you know, that's Hamas. Many words in English, look at this, this is amazing. That, oh. Look, the place of gather, a, a, a church in Hebrew, no bad connotation in Hebrew. Knesia, like the Greek took it from there and said, Ecclesia, right? You hear that? Kle Knesia, Ecclesia. Coming from Ecclesiastics, the book of Ecclesiastics just means a book of it's gathering. That's what Ecclesiastics is, and Knesia is a place of gathering. Hebrew root Kaf Nun Samech Kanas means to to space gather to put people together. That's all. So the name reflects what it is: people gathering. It's called Knesia. A synagogue has the same connotation. Beit. Knesset, right? A house of gathering. And so is the Israeli parliament called Knesset. But what is the place of worship for the Muslims in Hebrew? It's in, in their language as well, they, except for they don't have a clue where it's coming from. The word for a mosque in Hebrew, which is close to English, and to uh, uh, English is close to Hebrew, is Misgad. That's the name for a mosque, Misgad. But it's not the miss, M-I-S-S, -S, and then God. <laughs> Even though people hear it, miss God, it's coming from the root sagad. Samech gimel dalet. Sagad. And you know what that means? To idolize. To worship an idol. That's the word for miss God. That's sagad. And they're using it. They say sajid. They say sajid. We don't impose it on them. The word sagad in Hebrew means to idolize, to idol, to, to praise and worship an idol. And they use it proudly. So I'm going to the mosque. Ma, you, you hear that? Mosque, misgad, you hear that? The sak, the, those letters there, same thing. Sometimes they get a little twist, like the pay. There is no pay in Hebrew and, and English. There is a P and there is an F. In Hebrew, the same letter, P and F. So you'll find out that the same word is using. And look at that. Here is another one so close to English. You're talking about money. Where is that coming from? It's an ancient English or old English. Yeah, really, yeah. Listen to the word. It's in the Bible. Do you remember the manna? Manna is the portion. But why is it the portion? The manna. Manna. Mana in Hebrew means to count. Counting is mana or a portion because you count. Okay, that's for you. This is for you. And the manna was given in portion, some from every day, right? And Shabbat the double. So the word mana in Hebrew, one of them means to count. And this is where money came about. You know what? <laughs> Get to any bank here, any, any bank. And who is the first person? Let's speak with somebody else. Jeff is like getting mad at me, you know? Uh, let's speak on, let's speak on you. What's your name, sir? Greg? Greg, okay. So Greg is going to the bank, right, your branch. And who is the person that normally talks to you? Who is the first one you, you go to? The, not the manager, but who, who do you see there? The teller. That's right. Do you agree? Is that, the teller? is that also you're meeting the teller when you go to the bank? And do you too meet the teller when you go to the bank, the gentleman there? And the lady says, yes, yes, you meet the teller. A lot? You meet them a lot? Okay. Doesn't matter. When you meet the teller, so I guess once you go, um, Greg, right? You approach your teller, 
the teller says to you, oh, hello, Greg. Once upon a time, there was a king, and the king was beyond the mountains. It was far away from the ocean, and he had a beautiful daughter, and the king, he did not do that, or other story, right? He doesn't tell you anything, right, the teller? <laughs> He's not telling you anything, so... No, did you hear stories from your teller when you go there and say, oh, hello, oh, today I'm going to tell you about... No, they don't do that, right? Why don't they do that? And why they're called on earth tellers there? What do they tell you? They are called tellers because of a mistake in interpreting Hebrew into English. The word in Hebrew is, uh, for teller is so fair. You heard of the so fair stam? The scribe, the so fair? You did? Okay, the root so fair in Hebrew, safar, also means to count. But it means another thing too. It means also to tell, T-E-L-L, -L, and also to count, you know, go, whatever. So whomever ascribed has two meanings, to tell and to count. So a teller is really called teller mistakenly. Should have called a counter, because he counts. That's what they do, they count. But they pick the wrong interpretation of the Hebrew, and they call them teller, and they make them doom forever, because they don't tell anything. They only, you know. <laughs> And they're called teller, but go tell it to your teller. I say, well, why are you called teller? And each one of them that I know is a scratch here, around here. Some of them have more hair than I do, but it's the same area, you know. <laughs> they scratch. Um, another, another word in, he, in English, that I, I have no doubt that is mistake. You call you call Tacoma or Puyallup or other cities here, you call them cities, right? And you spell them with C-I-T-Y, right? Big mistake, big time mistake. It should be S-I-T-Y. Why? Very simple. You know why? You do? You do? You do know why? No. Okay. <laughs> I thought you know, I mean, it's, it's, no, all the knowledge is not mine. It's like we all gather it from other places. Um, the, the word in Hebrew, um, you know the word, you're supporting, you, 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 this congregation supporting Itamar in Israel, right? Itamar in Israel is a settlement, right? Settlement. Jeff is nodding his head. I'm going to leave alone Greg and I'm going to go back to Jeff. You say, yes, settlement. Sound to you like set, 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 set. sitting, right? It's, you're sitting down, settlement. And that's what it is. You walk. You get to the place and you settle there, right? And that's how it works exactly parallel in Hebrew. You settlement, well, the word is yeshav. Yeshiva, you know, they go to yeshiva. Why it's called yeshiva? Because they're yeshiva. They're sitting down and studying all the time. And that is coming from what word? From Shabbat, from Saturday. And why Saturday is called Shabbat anyway? Because shev in Hebrew means to sit down. Every day, you, they couldn't think at that time of jobs that you'll do when you're standing up. You had to sit down to work in those ancient days. So when Shabbat came, people sat down. They did not stand. And that's why the word Shabbat is connected to the word sitting. And so is the word settlements in, in Hebrew. Yeshuv, or a city, is Yeshuv. So you see the connection in Hebrew, of course. Shabbat, sitting, that it all relates. And then in English, settlement works with the S, right? But why city not? It's the same thing. It's from sitting. Somewhere there along the line made a mistake. Instead of putting it an S to the city that relates to sitting down or settling, put a C there. So just be aware. Every time you write city, remember, somebody made a mistake and contradicted Hebrew in here. <laughs> all right. Uh, why do we... We, we pick up, you see, I can't even start with that. The importance of doing it in Hebrew is getting closer to the source and avoiding this broken phone. Because when you, and, and the other one in praying, when you emanate a word, I did not complete what I, I was trying to say in Genesis 1. I only say, he said, Yehi or means be light, and it's been light. But what I didn't complete there, is the manifestation of the three tenses that we have, or forms of existence. You know, we can talk about today and yesterday and tomorrow, right? 
The yesterday, what do you do with that? I mean, yeah, you can, ling you can, you can yearn and you can miss those days that have gone. And uh, I, I still do that once in a while in front of the mirror. You know, I don't remember why I do that, just to get the, my, uh, my hair out of my eyes. That's the past. And the future is still something you cannot touch. You know, it's, it's, it's still not here. And all we have really that we can touch right now and see and, and use our senses is the present. But look, God says, Yehi or, Yehi or. You can hear Yehi is spelled with three Hebrew letters. I'm going to go over all of them on Monday. I wish people would come because I can guarantee you each one of you coming to the class will end up within 20 minutes a writer of Hebrew. And I'm not exaggerating. I exaggerate it. Well, what I do normally in other places, I lock the door. I have two guards. <laughs> Nobody leaves without writing Hebrew. But you'll write. <laughs> You'll write without a doubt. You write because it, we're working on a different level. It's not like something. Oh, you need to think. It's uh, uh, we're working on your cellular level. We're putting Hebrew to the cells, and you start writing within five minutes. But you'll be in a proficiency of 50 percent within, I would say, an hour or an hour and a half. We'll try to do it on Monday. I can't cover the entire book, but we'll cover some solid parts that you'll feel more comfortable in Hebrew. So. <laughs> We control, God controls the creation. We just know it by one word. He says, Yehi, be light, and there is light. And he's using three letters by saying Yehi. It's in your Bible. Yud, hey, and again, Yud. Wait a second. Those Yud, hey, what is Yud, hey? That's Ya. Ya. Like from Hallelujah, right? So, suspicion here is using the letters of, and, and again, Yud. Now, be aware, Yud, the letter Yud alone, many times stands for the name of God. We, we see it in writing. They put Yud, little apostrophe, that's the name of God. Or Yud, hey, definitely, yeah, like in hallelujah. So, Yud alone is God. Yud, hey, is definitely God. And again, Yud there. The B in Hebrew, creation, is using part of his name. You know, the name is called the uninterpreted name, or I call it the essence name of the Lord, is made of four letters, two doubles, yud Hey, vav Hey, right? yud Hey, vav Hey. Yehi is using three of his letters. But you say, oh, well, coincidence. I mean, so what? You know, there are many letters in Hebrew. Yeah, right. So let's look at past, future, and present. You would say was, happen, right? And there is a statement there, I'll be whatever I'll be. I mean, I am what I am, right, Pastor? But really in Hebrew it says there, I will be whatever I will be. The word there is eheye, asher eheye. But let's leave it alone. Let's go to past, future, and present. Past, happened, was in Hebrew. Simply the word was in Hebrew is haya, spelled with hey, yud, hey. Once again, each one even alone is the name of God. Together, definitely, haya. Wow. So the past, the word past, is three quarters of his name. It's already part of his name. And so is the word be, the creation. So you say coincidence, it's a prob maybe. Let's see what is will be. Wow, look at that. The will be, the word will be is in Hebrew, ye, he, ye. And it's spelled yud, hey, yud, hey. Twice, yud, hey, yud, hey. Twice the name of God, that's future. It's a little suspicious here that this is what he what happens in the past, in the, in the future, but you'll say we'll have the present to rescue us from this strong cleavage, or, uh, connection to the name of God. Really? Well, the word for present is in Hebrew, hove. Hey, vav, hey. Three quarters of his name, almost completely his name. So his name is part of past, present, future, and Jeff, creation as well. He says, Yehi. Now, jumping a few chapters forward in Genesis, and look, 
your English is missing something in the, in, in, uh, the story of creation of man, or with the first man, Adam. It says there, let us, okay, let's, let's assume, that, let's leave alone the let us, okay? He says, we shall make, or we make right now. The word, remember, the word of God is the action in Hebrew. You don't need mediation. No words to mediate. But he says in plural, let's say, I'm using it for now, let's make a man, right? Adam. In your English, it says, in our image, right? Not in Hebrew. In Hebrew, there are two words there. It says, betzalmenu kidmutenu. In our image, at our shape. Wow. So what is that meaning to us? It means then that not only we look exactly like God, you and I and all of us look exactly like God. Okay? We are also very clear. We are a mirror image of the inner because it has two words in Hebrew. There is no coincidence there. No coincidence. Why betzalmenu kidmutenu? at our shape, in our image. You know, two words they are using in indicate two different things. Similar, yet different. Tselmenu, tselem means the shape, the image. The word camera is derived from that one. It's matzlema, coming from tselem, same word. So we know it's the image. So fine, nice, we are made something. Well, that's what the father would want his child to be in his image, right? But, and we have the baby and say, wow, you look so much like me. Hey, it looks so much like you, you know. We find the thing of the children. Same thing, God wanted the same thing. He wanted something that to look in his image, inside and outside. But there were some limitations. Listen to this. Two trees I planted in the garden. So he tells to Adam and, me, and, and Eve, Chava, have fun here. There's, there are two trees here. Don't touch it. Okay, do me a favor. Just shy away from those two. And what do they do? They go to the first one, luckily to that one first. Well, what was all those trees? The first one is Etz Hadaat Tov Vera, the tree of knowledge, good from bad, which is what? Which is what? It's science. What is science? There are scientists here, I'm sure there are, doctors and physicians or scientists or, or, or engineers. You know what's the, what's the base foundation of, of the empirical science? It's trial and error, right? If it's true, or not true, you try any test that you're doing, you're trying it. If it works, it's true. <laughs> really? Um, so you try. If it works, fine. If it's not, not. Trial and error. This is how you reach the development we are now. But we're not supposed to have this ability of trial and error because we're not supposed to know the difference between good and bad. It means succeed or not succeed. We're not into that gear in the original plan of God. Etz hadaat, daat, knowledge, daat, tov, vera, good and bad. But we ate from that tree. We did eat from the tree. And what happened is we made one step closer to God. That's why we can fly to the sky, to the moon right now, or, or, or in another 500 years to another place there, or who knows. This is what allows technology because of eating from that tree. But there is, a stent, there is a verse there in the Bible that is very alarming. God is saying, I need to chase you away from here, lest you also eat from the other tree and you will become just like God. Just like God. So we know the looks is the same, the capacity is the same, us and God, except for no eternal life and no unlimited knowledge. We stole the knowledge, but he chased us away before we'll have also eternal life just here on this earth, right? Not in the second state, but on this earth, and we'll be just like him. So he tells us what is really the difference between him and us. This is the way to look at it just by what's in the Bible. It's not an interpretation. I think so. Who am I? I'm nobody. But it's not my thought. It's the words in the Bible says, Vehayitem ke Elohim. I'm not saying, I haven't said here almost anything that is not written there. And you know the verses. I don't even need to tell you it's in there. Most of them you already know by heart. I wanted to go. I didn't get the chance to do that. But look. Uh, okay, uh, I don't, I, I'll skip some, I'll leave it on Monday, but I'll do one here. You're we're doing that. You're doing that when you're casting. We're talking about casting a blessing here. 
What do you do by doing that? Besides of broadcasting down, you are, it's like a tabernacle. It's like a protection you're putting over people, right? This is a tabernacle. You put something under your wings. You know the expression, it's under the wings. What, under, what other wings do we know? This is the unspoken manifestation of the divinity of God. We know about the God that is the Father, the Son, the Holy Sp the Spirit that hovers over the face of the water, but we're missing out of the manifestation of the wingy God. The Shekinah that Pastor Art mentioned yesterday. I spoke on that with Pastor Mark too on the phone. What is the reference to Shekinah in Hebrew? We say in Hebrew, Tachat Kanfei HaShekinah, under the wings of the Shekinah. The Shekinah is there to protect us. And where is that principle coming from, if not from Deuteronomy 32, 11? Kenesher ya'ir kino al gozalav yerachef, yifros knafav, yikachehu isa'ehu al evrato. People, this is what the founders of this nation decided to put, because of this verse, on the national symbol of America, the eagle. The eagle came from this verse I'm reading you now, from Deuteronomy 32, 11. This is what was in their mind when they made the eagle reigning here as, as a national emblem. It says, as an eagle steers up its nest, Yair Kinodes also hover, you know, protect his nest, over his egg, its eaglets will hover. This is the comparison to God that will protect his people. Israel, just like the e eagle, that it can be a very evil creature when you come to hit its eaglets. This is a very protective, I mean, most animals are, but the eagle is known to be vicious when it comes to protecting its, um, its eaglets. So soul God will hover over us, See the image and protect it. The founders of this father took the eagle from that verse in Deuteronomy and made it the eagle because this is not just an eagle of fun that was flying here in the Indian reservation. No, it was the eagle, eagle of the Bible. It was God protecting its nation. This was the nation under God. It was established very well, this country, very deeply in the Bible. And furthermore, when you do that, when you extend your hand, you're putting the Shekinah, a, mini, a, 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 a mini, a small miniature Shekinah. It's not just like you're extending your hand for beauty or for beautification or for any reason for that. You're creating a micro Shekinah under your wing. And so is, I saw many people with the talis here when you're dancing. And the talit, think of what happens. You open it and you put it like that, it creates the same shield of protection of the Shekinah glory, what is, you call it, you're under the wings of the Shekinah, the wings of protection. What I didn't manage to speak about is the second moment, the crucial moment of the history of the world, and the shocking truth about Messiah, life, death, and salvation in Hebrew. There is one word in Hebrew that relates, that connects all of them. Um, believe it or not, I learned about the salvation tonight, last night. I knew about death, life, and Messiah, I did not know about the, about the salvation, but apparently I found it in the New Testament, which is true. It could be a tool for teaching Hebrew because things are, you cannot find them in the old, you can find them in the new, even in the Hebrew. I missed about a large part of what I wanted to do, and um, but that's the nature of things here. We have to stop, oh, there's another one, but we can. So. Uh, I'll do it on Monday if uh, God is willing and if you decide to join it will be a great pleasure and I want to thank you very much El Shaddai and the people of El Shaddai to accept me here. Tadaraba. I guarantee that um, we will certainly look at language different especially the Hebrew language than we ever have before and particularly pay attention to the words that we speak when we pray. Amen? So gracious God, uh, our Father Abba, thank you, Lord, uh, for your graciousness and your generosity in presenting to us your Torah, your teachers, who will bring us, Father, a, a knowledge of your language, 
so that we might follow the proper protocol in approaching you. We love you, Father, and we thank you for all good things that come from you. In Yeshua's name. And now as we more appropriately understand that it's God who wants to bless us. He wants to come and bless you. And he told Moses to tell Aaron, this is how I want you to bless my people. And he said, Ivarekaka, Yahweh, Vaish, Marekaka, Yaer, Yahweh, Panavi, Aleka, Vihuneka, Yisa, Yahweh, Panavi, Aleka, Viasam, Laka, Shalom. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. Go in peace. God bless you. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Ben Gigi. God bless. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries dot U.S. Be blessed and shalom.